Hi you guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you enjoy these videos and you love makeup and you love true crime and you love watching it weekly, definitely consider subscribing guys. It would mean so much to me. And if you have any cool case suggestions, definitely go ahead and leave them in the comments down below. I always read the comments. So yeah, let's get into today's video. Today's case is about a man named Michael Philpot or Mick Philpot. He was somewhat of a local celebrity, you know, somewhat in England, mostly known for his many, many children. I'm talking about 17 children. But today we're going to talk about what he did to those children and what a great guy he was. Not really. And I actually heard of this case like a few years ago and it was always on my mind. And I felt like every time I would ask someone, like someone that was into true crime, if they knew about it, they didn't really know about Mick Philpot. So I said, why not talk about it on my channel today? So let's talk about Mick and who he was. So Mick was born in 1956 in Derbyshire, England. And honestly, he seems to just start off in life as a not so decent guy. And in 1976, when he was around 19 years old, he decides to join the army and that's when he begins his training. During this time, he meets a woman named Kim Hill. Kim was born in June 1961 and she was the youngest of three siblings and her father was actually an officer in the army and her mom worked in the NAFI, which was like a shop that was used by the army personnel. Kim was just 15 when she met 19-year-old Mick and I know that doesn't seem like you know, a huge age difference because they're both kind of in their teens. But think of yourself at 15 and think about yourself at 19. It's a pretty big difference. So when she meets Mick, 15-year-old Kim, she sees Mick coming across as super cocky and arrogant. And when he asks her for her number, she gives it to him. She stated that, you know, when you have your first boyfriend or the first guy that's like really into you, and that like butterfly feeling you feel in your stomach, like that's what she felt with Mick. So their relationship, you know, it just starts off like that, you know, 19 and 15, you don't think much of it. And it's a bit of an age difference, but when you're 15, like everything is so exciting. Like you're just coming out of like being almost a kid into like having this 19 year old guy into you. Like I get it. Everything your first boyfriend does is like so exciting and so romantic, even if he's a complete douche lord. So that's exactly how it started off for Kim and Mick. Mick started off super charming but soon, very soon, he changes from being like this huge catch to being controlling and violent. At the age of 19, a 19 year old, he imposes a curfew on Kim. If she misses that curfew and comes home later than you know her allocated time, he hits her. But before she can actually sort of get upset and like like realize what he's doing to her. He starts crying. He starts saying, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again. It was a mistake. Don't, you know, don't end the relationship with him. Don't tell her dad. And she believed him. She didn't, she didn't, you know, tell anyone. And she continued on with this relationship with Mick. And on a side note, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced anything like this, but I mean, not that I have, but when I was in high school, I actually had a friend. She wasn't like a close friend, but she was like a friend of a friend. And I remember she was dating like a 20 year old and we were like 15. And he was pretty religious, like came from a religious background. And he did the same thing to her. Like he would impose a curfew on her. If she, if we went out like in a group, you know, we'd go out to like a dinner, like dinner or clubbing or something like that. And back then you go to like underage clubs. You don't really go, you know, to real clubs he would pick her up at like nine, 10 o'clock. Like he wouldn't let her really be with her friends and kind of live that normal teenage life. And she totally like let it happen. And to be honest, like thinking back, I feel like he definitely was aggressive with her. I don't know if he like hit her, hit her, but I know one time I saw him like pull her into his car. Like it was just crazy. And at the time I was just like, what is she doing with like full douchebag? But you're young too, so you don't realize the severity of it. But what happened was that she actually ended up marrying him because when, like, as soon as she, like, hit her 20s, like, he made her marry him. And then 
they have kids now and it's like she's still under like that kind of control but I guess it's because of like the religious thing they had to get married I don't know like but I just remember like it was crazy. It was a crazy relationship. So now for Kim, what Mick started off with was sort of like private beatings, you know, like she'd miss the curfew and then she'd come home and he'd be waiting there. And I mean, I don't know where he was waiting for her because I don't think they lived together, right? She was only 15, but I'm guessing he would meet her or whatever and then he would beat her. But these private beatings eventually became public humiliations. They were at a bar one time and she, Kim says, she didn't want to play pool with Mick. She just wasn't in the mood. And keep in mind, they were in a crowded bar. He grabbed the thick end of a pool cue stick, you know, like to play pool, like a cue stick. And he whacked it straight across her mouth in front of like a full crowded pub bar full of guys. Not one of them did anything to help her, but her mouth just burst open bleeding. And he made her just sit in the corner while that happened and not one guy said anything to him and not one guy like tried to help her, which blows my mind because he was he was only 19, 20 at the time, you know, like I'm sure everyone there, you know, could have been older as well, but nobody did anything to help him. Then his beatings turn to bite marks, bruises, broken cheekbones. He breaks her fingers like severe for a 15, 16 year old to go through. She is completely submissive to him because she states that you never say no to Mick Philpot. You never, ever say no. Once he breaks her arm and then another time he shoots her in the groin with a crossbow. And he did this because he felt that her dress was too short, like what she was wearing. Okay. On another occasion, and this one like, oh, freaks me out. He takes a hammer and he smashes Kim's kneecap because she was paying too much attention to a baby that she was babysitting, like this guy. And then every time he would return from one of his army postings, he would accuse her of having an affair and cheating on him and just being disloyal. And he would just continue violent assaults on her. He would even go AWOL just so he could like, like keep a tab on her and like make sure she was where she said she was going to be. Now, this part I find, you know, a bit strange again. Um, her friends, you know, school, keep in mind she's going to school. Didn't anyone notice her injuries, broken kneecaps, broken fingers, pool cue, you know, smashed on her mouth? But Kim says that she would tell the school that she would get into fights with other like kids and she would beg them to tell her father like that's the reason why she's all bruised and battered because maybe her father was also questioning. I mean, I'm sure her father was questioning it. Like, why are you always getting your ass beat? And I don't know. I mean, is the school going, oh, you got into a fight. Let me go and tell your father that you got into a fight that we didn't witness so that your father will believe that these injuries came from that like it just doesn't make sense to me she was 15 16 at the time you know and I'm sure her parents I mean maybe her parents knew she had a boyfriend a girl especially doesn't usually get into that many fights you know and broken fingers and bruises all over you and you know busted lip and you know her dad being an army officer I find that like crazy that he didn't he didn't pick this up you know it's kind of sad so after two years of being in this horrific relationship with Mick, Kim's like, all right, I'm done. I can't take anymore. So when she's around 17 years old in the summer of 1978, she decides to leave Mick and she does this by writing him a letter and she sends him this letter explaining, you know, that she's leaving him and that she's done. But obviously Mick's like, what did I tell you? You don't say no to Mick Philpot. So on the 4th of July, 1978, he decides to follow her home. And obviously, you know, he knows her father is an army um, sergeant. So he waits for her father to leave and go to work on a night shift. And I don't know how he knew that was going to happen, but I'm guessing two years in a relationship, he probably knew some type of schedule, you know, for her father. So when her father leaves for this night shift, he breaks into her home while she's sleeping and he attacks her in her bed. Mick stabs Kim 27 times with a nine inch knife 
And her mother was home at the time. So when she hears Kim's, you know, horrific screams, she rushes into the bedroom, sees Mick doing this to her daughter and tries to stop him. And he turns around and he stabs her mother as well. He stabs her mother 11 times in the back, mainly as she's trying to escape. She's like running down the stairs. And that's when he's stabbing her in the back. And then once he follows her down the stairs, his mother's running away. Her mother's running away. He comes back up into Kim's bedroom and tries to finish Kim off. He places a knife at the top of Kim's body and then drags it down. She then realized that he'd actually sliced her abdomen open. Like, wow. So neighbors obviously hearing the commotion. And I'm guessing that um, Kim's mother had ran out and asked for help. They call the police and paramedics arrive to find Mick sitting at the top of the stairs and he's still holding the knife and he's laughing. And he says to the paramedics, I wouldn't bother. She's a goner. I've done a good job on her. Like the insanity of this guy, like clearly. And Mick's nearly right. Like her injuries are so life threatening that Kim actually like dies twice on the way to the hospital. So she like stopped breathing multiple times. Her lungs, liver, kidneys, and bowel are all perforated from the stab wounds. But Kim surprisingly survives and so does her mother. A nine inch knife, like, <sighs> and she later discovers that the injuries, like apart from like the horrific scarring, are far worse than what she ever imagined them to be. A jury finds Mick guilty of attempted murder and wounding with intent. So he gets seven and a half years for attempted murder and he serves that concurrently uh, five years for grievous bodily harm. Like, like, so basically he just gets seven years for trying to kill someone. Two people. Okay. So while he's in prison, he actually writes Kim a letter. And in that letter, he states, you know, hey, Kim, you know, you know, I didn't mean to actually, you know, do any harm to you. And when I get out, we can be together. I hope you'll forgive me. We should just start again and get married and, you know, life will be great. Kim says that when she read that letter, she was literally like, what? Like he was just speaking to her like he was just on vacation. Like, I'm just going to be back, you know, I'll uh, see you when I get out. Like, it's crazy. So then just four years into his sentence, Mick is released from jail. I don't know why for attempted murder. I don't know why. So it's 1982 when he's released. And as soon as he's released, he meets this woman named Pamela Lomax and they get married super quickly. Mick must have had some type of charm on him and they have three children together. They have two sons and a daughter. And like most of these men who are violent behave, he begins behaving the exact same way he did with Kim with Pamela. Starts off being super charming, you know, Mick Philpot, and then he becomes the real Mick Philpot. The domestic violence that Pamela um, receives is constant, constant. But again, she's too afraid to leave him or even report him to the police because he warns her about what he did to his ex, Kim. He reminds her like, hey, do you remember what I did to my, you know, my little ex, Kim, if you, uh, if you want to behave the same way, we can do the same thing to you. Like he would just threaten her and she was obviously afraid. And now keep in mind, there are children involved. So it's like, what does she do? So instead of reporting him, she would just pray and pray and pray that he would end up leaving her. And surprisingly, Pamela gets her wish when Mick meets another woman named Heather Kehoe. Wait, wait, wait. Let me rephrase. He meets a child, Heather, who was just 14 years old at the time, while Mick was like 37. So they began like this weird freaking affair. And then when she was 16, she ran away from her parents' house to go and live with Mick. Heather finds him, you know, sometimes charming, sometimes domineering, but always always in control. Mick's plan is pretty simple. He wants to take his three children away from his first wife, Pamela, and bring them to live with Heather and himself. Heather can now be their new, their new mommy. Obviously, Pamela's not going to allow this to happen. So Heather instead ends up having two children, 
both boys and she has these kids like fairly quickly, like back to back. But Mick wasn't happy because he wanted a daughter. You know, most men want boys and he had enough boys, but he's like, Heather, why did you give me two boys in a row? You should have given me a boy and a girl. So his solution is to beat Heather, which is ridiculous because I mean, I'm pretty sure like men, like the sperm chooses the gender of the baby. So technically this is Mick's fault. Heather then says that Mick then started teaching his older sons to be violent with their own mother, Heather. Mick wanted Heather to produce more kids, but she didn't conceive again. And I'm sure she made sure of that, at least with him. So then Heather, after dealing with this for so long, like this third woman, she tried to run away. And when she attempted this, he again threatens her like, you know what I did to my ex Kim? You want to, you want to be the same, uh, you want to, you want to have the same thing happen to you? So obviously she was now terrified too. And at this point, Mick's sexual and physical abuse is so severe with Heather that she actually decides to run away, leaving her kids with Mick because it's so bad. I'm sure that's not what she wanted to do. She had to abandon them to be able to escape, but you know, she wanted them back. So she fought for custody. So they have this like really long, lengthy custody battle and she wins custody of her like of her kids but for Mick this is only just the beginning of his like smear campaign against Heather like he would do this to her for years to come in 1991 Mick was given a two-year conditional discharge for like an assault he committed on a colleague where he headbutted a colleague and I don't know why the court system is so lenient with him I don't understand I don't I don't understand so in the year 2000, Mick meets another woman now, and her name is Mairead Duffy, and she is just 19 years old, and she is a single mother. Now, Mairead had previously left a previous abusive relationship, so what she didn't know is that she was entering another one. But Mairead, she's a bit different. She sees Mick as like her guardian angel, you know, he took her and protected her from this abusive partner and now he was her new you know hero in her eyes so she moves in with him pretty quickly following the start of their relationship and clearly Mick had no problem with kids so she brings her child along too and she to be honest was kind of ideal for a guy like Mick because she was young, she was vulnerable, she was needy, she was pretty isolated, she didn't have like family or friends. But just a year into their relationship, Mick's like, okay, well, I need some more ladies. So he finds another person to date. He meets 17-year-old single mother, Lisa Willis, and he makes Lisa his mistress. Now, Lisa, she was also a pretty vulnerable person I mean she's a single mother she was an orphan and now most women aren't going to be like yeah hell yeah just have a mistress like no big deal and you could say like oh well you know he was probably violent and he forced her into this but Maraid was a little bit different she had never had this like sense of security that she had had that she found with Mick so she didn't want to lose this so she agreed to Mick having this mistress and this freaking unusual if you can call it that relationship. So Mick's like, great. So he buys this caravan and he like parks it in front of his like home with Maraid. And he parks this caravan like in the front garden of the home. And that was like his sex caravan. So he would use that every other night. He would bring Maraid or Lisa in, you know, to have sex with. He's like, who do I need tonight? And that's where they would do their deed, you know? So as to not do it in the home in front of the kids, I guess. So then in May, 2003, Maraid and Mick end up getting married and you know they have a nice little wedding and Lisa is Mairead's bridesmaid please guys tell me what I'm talking about like sometimes I'm just like people really do these kinds of things like oh my god keep in mind that we're just talking about Mick's life before we're actually talking about what he did just keep that in mind as if this wasn't enough to just make him removed from the earth permanently but no he left behind an even greater legacy. So at this stage, over the next decade, him, Maraid, Lisa, they're all, you know, they're 11 kids, by the way, at this point, 
are all just, you know, living, chilling peacefully, I guess. And they're all living in mixed council house, like a house that's provided like by the government. So there's Maraid and her six kids now. So one from a different baby daddy and then five by Mick. Lisa and her five children. So one from a previous relationship and four from Mick. So Mick is the biological father of nine of those 11 kids. So then after Lisa moves in, Mick now starts to be violent with her. And he begins to beat Lisa over the identity of the father of her child. He keeps telling her that she's lying and he becomes like obsessed with infidelity. And to be honest, this child, you know, was conceived before Mick was ever in the picture. So it's none of his business really. But he believes that the father of Lisa's first child is actually her brother-in-law. So her sister's husband and he keeps beating Lisa like you know confirm confirm like you know he's the father I know he's the father and again it's none of his business even if he was the father it's none of his business but he beats Lisa to confirm his suspicion you know and and despite the beatings she never confesses to this and then Mick develops an obsession with Lisa on three occasions he actually asks Marae to divorce him so he can marry Lisa legally and Marae never refused him but this time she did some rare occasions of Maraid refusing Mick. She will risk everything, including her children, but she's not going to lose her man. She's not going to lose her marriage to Mick. What I forgot to mention earlier was that on 23rd December 2002, like after his relationship with Heather, um, that's the date that she received legal custody of her two kids. And Mick, over the years, to mark this occasion, I guess, he was so angry and infuriated by it that he would smash the Christmas tree each year in the living room on that date like to mark the occasion that was basically Mick's way of like showing how angry he was that his children were taken away like okay now given after everything you've heard I'm pretty sure you guys can tell that Mick is not really going to hold down a job because you're going to bash a freaking colleague's head in so during this time it was Lisa and Maraid who actually had jobs and worked and took care of the children and took care of the house and did everything. But despite that, all the money they earned went into Mick's bank account, as it should. And he also received government benefits for all 11 of the children. And now this is something to keep in mind that more kids equals more money. Yeah. The income that Mick received alone from the benefits of the kids was in excess of £60,000 a year. The children really meant nothing to him. It was the money that meant something. It merely demonstrates the size of his empire. It's Maraid and Lisa who actually take care of the children and ensure that they're well fed and they go to school and do their homework and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So because of this, there is no reason for social services to intervene. So now at this point, Mick's domestic violence decreases, but his control doesn't. Like, he's still the kingpin of the household. Maraid and Lisa, they don't even get a house key, like a front door key. Whatever Mick says, they will obey. And that's how they lived. Their home was a three-bedroom semi-detached council house. The caravan was in the front. And even with, you know, this freaking caravan... The home was far too small for this entire family. The conditions were super cramped and then Mick makes Maraid and Lisa pregnant at the same time. And when he does this, he goes to the Derbyshire Council and he's like, all right, you need to give me a bigger home. So the council tells him, well, nothing is available, dude. Like, can't just give you a home, like, from the sky. So Mick's like, okay, I need to do something about this. So he decides to go on TV and he's like, aha, uh -huh. that's what's going to get me, you know, some more attention and they're going to give me a home based on, you know, my situation. So in 2006, Mick goes on like all the talk shows. He makes his, you know, rounds. He also does like tabloid interviews, documentary requests. And he says, some people may call me a scrounger, but you know, I'm not, I'm actually a really good father. That was his, that was his viewpoint. So then in 2007, Mick gets on to the Jeremy Kyle show, which is basically like UK's Jerry Springer or Maury Povich, you know, of that time. So he goes on this show to defend his lifestyle 
and say that he would like to marry Lisa and divorce Maraid. And to be fair, and then he said he would have a vasectomy, you know, so that he wouldn't have any more kids. And, you know, he was hoping all this publicity would lead to the council securing a nice big fat home for him, which is so pathetic. Like he's doing all this just to get a free house, like instead of just going to get a job and work. So all of this fails to get him a free house, a bigger house, but it does earn him something. And that is a nickname where he began to be known as Shameless Mick. And he was shameless due to him going on TV and basically like begging like a loser for like council, like a bigger council house instead of getting his ass up and working for all his children that he chose to bring into this world. He becomes like a personification of like the worst excesses of the welfare state and a shorthand for everything that is wrong with Britain. Like it, he just becomes like the spokesperson for that, unfortunately. Then in February of 2012, Lisa tells Maraid that she's taking her five children swimming. But in reality, she's leaving with all five of her children. You know, one that was from another father and the four that were biologically mixed. Lisa was so done. And to raise no suspicion, she actually did pretend she was going swimming. She took nothing else with her like no possessions and after this she moves in with her sister to escape Mick. Now this action was later said to be the catalyst or the trigger for what's about to come. At first Mick tries to you know uh, sweet talk Lisa tries to get her back that way but it doesn't work so then he resorts to bullying her and then that doesn't work so when he fails on these two methods he now devises a plan. So remember, Mick was actually obsessed with Lisa. He even wanted to divorce Marae to marry Lisa. So now when he wasn't getting what he wanted, he has to now devise a plan and he gets some help. He uses Marae and a family friend named Paul Mosley or some articles that saying Paul Mosley is Mick's best friend. So now before we move on, I came across something that I hadn't actually heard before. And I think it's important to mention that Nick act, Mick actually um, frequented and took part in dogging sessions. Now, that's not what you think it is, and it's got nothing to do with dogs, like I thought. But it's basically the practice of watching or engaging in sexual activity, usually in a public place, public sex, or also watching other people have sex. So you just enjoy that. That's a dogging session. So now, because he enjoyed that, he was with Maraid, right? So he used to force Maraid to take part in these sessions. And this even led Maraid uh, to falling pregnant to an unknown man that he just like made her have sex with. But then Mick found out she was pregnant from this guy, so he forced her to have an abortion. Maraid, you know, had previously had sex with other men while Mick just watched. And her explanation for such behavior was that she just wanted to do it to make Mick happy. Like she left these sessions feeling disgusted and embarrassed and horrified with herself, but it's what Mick wanted. Now, the two of them also used to have sex with their friend Paul Mosley, and they would actually have threesomes together, or, you know, he would make Maraid have sex with Paul, and they would smoke weed regularly together. So Mick basically was just like a dream come true. Like, I am so sad I never found a guy like him to be with. So at this time, 55-year-old Mick is now the biological parent of 17 children. He is father to none, and he's about to become the killer to six of his children. It's 10th May 2012. And Mick decides that this is a day to exact his revenge on Lisa. Mick and Maraid put their six children to bed. 13-year-old Dwayne, 10-year-old Jade, 9-year-old John, 8-year-old Jack, 6-year-old Jesse, and the youngest is Jaden, and he's just five years old. Imagine putting these kids to bed. They're kissing their mom and dad, you know, goodnight. Being children, you know, kids are either excited to get into bed or throw tantrums. Like, it's just a normal bedtime for them, and they don't know what their own mom and dad are about to do to them, but Mick and Maraid know what's about to happen. So once they put the kids to bed, they then invite their friend Paul over and all three of them start to just drink heavily and they're like partying that night. Maraid gets stoned and then she has a threesome 
with Mick and Paul on their family pool table. Fantastic. At around 3 a.m., they grab some of the petrol that they had acquired earlier and they start pouring it on the floor of the home. Paul then takes the petrol canisters and hides them so as to destroy or remove any incriminating evidence. 3.30 a.m., Mick sets the petrol on fire and he lights the trail leading from the hallway up to the stairs. Now, the kids were sleeping upstairs in a bedroom, so once the fire spread, if they were to come down the stairs, they have no way of an escape. He has now cut off any chance of them escaping. Mick Maraid and Paul now leave the home as the fire begins to take hold and they move to a neighbor's garden and Maraid then rings the emergency services. Mick then begins to tell the neighbors, I think, I think Lisa's the one that started this fire. Lisa, his ex. Now the very next day, there was actually a custody hearing between Mick and Lisa over the custody of their their five kids or four kids, four biological kids of Mick's. Mick wanted the children in his custody this time. He was not going to lose like he did to Heather because again, more kids equals more money. He wanted everyone to think Lisa started this fire to kill Mick to prevent him from attending the custody hearing. Now the fire plan, it was lit so that Mick could go in and be the hero and save the children. But what do you think happened? Now the neighbors say they were struck by Mick's behavior because there was no emotion coming out of them, either of them. A neighbor, Jamie, says that if Mick had grabbed him and said, come on, come on, like, you know, the kids are in there. Let's just, let's just go and let's just go and get them. He would have, you know, believed him or had some respect for him. He says that that's what a true father would have done. But this neighbor, he tries to get in through one of the back bedrooms, but it's impossible. The fire, it's lit by petrol. It's, it's taken over everything. All of a sudden, the smoke and the flames, like it's in, impenetrable, like no one can get through. And the children are inside sleeping upstairs and they're trapped inhaling these poisonous fumes. Firefighters quickly arrive but professionally they know that the children are lost. There's no way to save these kids. Each firefighter battles still to save them but obviously it's unsuccessful and somehow as sickening as this is some sort of like um mercy I guess or saving grace would be that the autopsy reports when the autopsy reports came back and they showed that the children they actually died fairly quickly and hopefully without much pain that same night Mick and Maraid asked their friends I'm guessing some of their neighbors whose names were Mick and Sharon to accompany them to the morgue to identify the kids bodies Mick looks at his dead kids in the coroner's office and shows no emotion and bizarrely his friend Mick second Mick breaks down in tears looking at the kids bodies it's Mick Philpot who then has to console his friend Mick but not all of Mick's children were dead the eldest Dwayne was still on life support so they go to the hospital to see him and Mick and Sharon follow and despite this life or death situation Mick the friend states that Mick and Maraid they go and they just wander off the hospital and they're just like walking around rather than being in the room with their son, their dying son who's on life support. And on one occasion, Mick, his name is Mick Russell, I should have mentioned that before, Mick Russell, he is appalled by what he sees his friend doing. I'm gonna call him Russell in this quick scenario so that it makes sense because Russell is appalled at what he sees next because he hears Mick shout to him. And when um, Russell looks over, he sees Mick grabbing some random girl's butt and he's like squeezing it and going, you see this? This is what I like. And Russell says to his friend Mick, you've got a lad in there dying, mate, and five of your kids are dead, and this is what you're focused on. Two days later, Dwayne dies in the hospital. Now, in the days following the fire, their local Catholic church holds memorial services for each of the six children. And on 16th May, Mick and his wife, Maraid, they hold like a press conference describing the events of the fire and like, how emotional it is and you know how sad it is and honestly watching this interview he seems he doesn't even seem like children have died like he's just like mm, yeah you know guys like yeah just have some sympathy for us it seems like he's almost asking for more money like that's what he is still focused on a fundraiser called catch me if i fall was even set up for the family to help pay for the children's funeral expenses and through this, Mick still tried to benefit from the death of his children. He demanded that any leftover money 
like from the fundraisers and, you know, all that kind of stuff should be given to him in Argos's vouchers. And I think that's like a grocery store or something. Correct me if I'm wrong. He also demanded that hundreds of teddy bears that have been um, placed outside the the family home, the one that was burned down, these teddy bears were fa- uh, placed there, you know, in memory of the children. He demanded that these teddy bears be auctioned off, you know, for how sad the situation is and the money proceedings to be given to him. And when organizers were questioning him, like, what are you talking about? Like, why would we do that? He states to one of them, like, just shut up and get on with it. Like, just give me the money. Like this guy. (laughs) So on 14th May, police, they obviously through their investigation, they're like, wait a second, there's petrol found in the letterbox. Like, the door and like the letterbox in the door, you know what I mean? Like there's the door and there's a letterbox in there. There's petrol found in there. So they were now like, wait a second, this is a murder investigation. Lisa and her brother-in-law were actually questioned um, as suspects because they believed that maybe they were the ones to start this fire because that was what Mick kept saying. But within hours, they were just released because there was no evidence. There was nothing like they clearly were innocent. Now, police obviously had their suspicions of the Philpots, Moraine and Mick early on because Mick's behavior was just so strange for someone who had lost so many children. Come on. Another thing I didn't mention when they were at the hospital for Dwayne, he bumps into this like young police, female police officer named jo- Joanne. And when he bumps into her, he's like flirting with her and then he invites her back to his hotel room when his son is dying in the hospital and five children are dead. Yeah. And obviously their home was burnt. So they were staying at a hotel pending the investigation. And again, hoping that he's going to get a free freaking home. So the police, now they have suspicions. They're like, you know what? We're just going to bug their hotel room. They just felt that Mick was a, was an actor playing a part and it just didn't sit right with them. So, so what I think actually happened was that Joanne, um, was one of the police officers to go. Okay, fine. You invited me to your hotel room. Let's go. They probably questioned them there. And during that is when they bugged their hotel room. So now the police have bugged the hotel room. Let's listen to what they've been talking about, right? So they heard Mick tell Maraid, you better stick to your story, right? And then he asks her, they're not going to find any evidence, right? You know what I mean? He was also heard saying that he was reliving the fire over and over again in his head. And he's saying, why couldn't I get my kids out? Why did this uh, fire spread so fucking quickly? Also, there was a ladder found at the back of the house, like like pointed, like aimed at the back bedroom upstairs. And that was supposed to be used in the rescue, but obviously it was never used. In the same recording, because you know, Mick can never go one day without doing something sexual. You can hear Maraid giving Paul oral sex And they believe this was done in an attempt to keep Paul like on their side, you know, like stick with the story, Paul, because the suspicion over Maraid and Mick was just growing and growing and growing. After this, Mick is also heard saying to Maraid, I'm proud of you. You know, I know you didn't want to do it and I know you didn't want to lie to the police, but I'm proud of you because you did it. On 28th May 2012, Mick, Maraid and Paul were now arrested and they were only arrested on the suspicion of murder. But after seeking additional time for questioning the three of them, the police were able to officially charge Mick and Maraid with murder on 30th May 2012. A discarded petrol container and a glove were actually found near the Philpott's home. And in November of 2012, forensic investigators determined that Mick and Maraid actually had petrol on the clothes they were wearing that night. On 5th November 2012, Paul was actually arrested and charged with murder, but then later it was downgraded to manslaughter. When Paul was previously arrested, like for murder at the start, he was released on bail in June, 2012. So in November is when he was like rearrested. And now the charges against Mick and Maraid were also downgraded to manslaughter because it was determined that they had not actually intended to kill their children. Instead, they wanted to frame Lisa for the fire, save the children, win custody of the children, and then claim all, you know, the benefits that they would receive from having the children in their custody. Get more money, get a bigger house, you know? That's that's what their goal was. Now, during the trial, they say it was like the Mick show. His description of his sexual behavior, his references to his dogging acts, his threesomes, his sexual desires. Why was he even mentioning this at the trial of the death of his children? I don't understand that. Either way, though, he was sealing his own fate with the jurors. I mean, who's going to like a guy that's acting like that? So he is so delusional that while he's being held during the trial, he writes to his friend Mick Russell. And in this letter, he talks about all the rape fantasies he's going to put into action as soon as he's released. In this letter, he also like 
talks about how once the trial is over, he's going to, you know, go to the children's graves and then force Marae to have sex with them. And I'm like, have sex with what? The graves or have sex with him? Like, I don't know. It wasn't really clear, but what a weirdo. Witnesses state that Paul had told them that they had begun practicing starting the fire six weeks before they actually committed the crime. And then during the trial, the image of these children like being well, ca uh, well cared for also started to crack. The autopsy showed that the children, only one of them um, had actually been in pajamas that night. The rest had just like gone to sleep in their day clothes, like jeans and stuff like that. The parents were too intent on getting like drunk, stoned and having threesome with each other to actually like put their kids in pajamas and actually properly tuck them into bed and, you know, Wish them good night. On 4th April 2013, Mick Philpot was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 15 years to be served. And Moraid and Paul were sentenced to 17 years uh, in prison, which they would have to serve at least half. On 29th November, uh, Moraid actually appealed her sentence, stating that it was too long, given that she was actually under the control of her husband, Mick, and she could not exercise like free will but her appeal was like quickly dismissed. Maraid was released on parole in 2020 after serving half of her sentence. And I feel like that's a shame because is Mick going to be released after 15 years? Like it's just a joke. It like, it's so infuriating how some of the justice system works and how they decide to like release people or not release people. Like it's so stupid that drugs can get like, look, I'm not saying drugs are good, right? I get it. But even like a small possession, you know, can give people similar charges to killing the children. Like it just doesn't make sense. <sighs> so all cases that we hear suck. They do. It's true crime. They suck. But this Mick guy, ooh, he really sucks. Six children had to die because of him. Because of greed and revenge on a woman who made the right decision to leave Mick thus saving her children. Can you imagine what Lisa must have been thinking? It could have been her children that Mick would have like forced her or devised a plan using her children to get more money or something. A stupid dumb ass plan concocted by three dumb ass people and Paul got involved for what? A blowjob? What a loser, for real. Six children had to die, never got the chance to grow up. I mean, Mick's own family were happy with the verdict that he received and actually wanted him to die, like wanted him to get the death sentence. I'm sure a lot of people did. And one thing to mention is Kim, his first girlfriend, she actually could never have any children because of the brutal stabbing and the way he destroyed her organs. He saw women as nothing more than his property and he saw children as nothing more than a way to make money while he sat his dumb ass down doing what? What did he do all day? He is the worst of the worst. Oh, okay, let me know your thoughts on today's case, guys. What do you think of Mick? Do you feel like they should have gotten way longer sentences? Because I do. So I would love to hear your thoughts down below. And thank you so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed and you're watching, what are you doing? Subscribe. <laughs> I would really love it. And I will see you in the next one, guys. Besitos. Mwah. Bye.